is the Light of Truth radio broadcast. This is the Light of Truth radio broadcast with Michael Boldea. Welcome to the program. So glad that you can join us. This is the Light of Truth radio broadcast. We are back live and in studio. And so uh, I am your humble host, Michael Boldia. If you tuned in last week, you may have noticed I was not present. And uh, this is because I was in transit. If I had made it to my destination uh, before uh, the program was due to air, I probably would have tried to get on via telephone. But I was still in transit. So I couldn't do it. I'm sure Gino filled in and did a good job. Uh, I, I spoke at a conference in Dallas, Texas. And uh, it was very spiritually uplifting. And as an added bonus, I got to meet uh, Brother Douglas and his lovely wife. We didn't get to spend that much time together. But it was nice to meet you if you're listening. God bless you. So, yes, uh, not only is Brother Douglas real, I actually met him. So, that said, uh, as you may have guessed, today we will be doing another Portraits of Peace segment uh, given the recent, recent events in, in Brussels, I guess it's unavoidable. Uh, then we will be answering a question, one single solitary question. I was forwarded this question yesterday, and although I started going through the five stages of grief, and uh, for those of you who don't know what they are, it's uh, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Uh, I went from denial to anger, then sort of stopped at anger. Uh, and I let it ferment because it was a very troubling email. Now, I, I don't bargain very well, and I don't get depressed. Uh, and honestly, I, I will not accept such nonsense. So anger is where I will dwell for some time Due to the implications of this question, like I said, uh, this promises to be a very eventful program. So either you'll hear me have an aneurysm live on the air, or I will be ranting for the next hour or so. I realize we were supposed to do the doctrine of baptisms. It's highly doubtful we're going to get to it because there's a lot to unpack in this question. There's a lot we need to get through as children of God. I'm, I'm, I'm just so tired of the nonsense. I'm just so tired of people trying to pervert the gospel of Christ because they don't want to part with their sin or they don't want to part with their vices or they don't want to part with their addictions or peccadillos. Like I said, however, we will begin with another segment of Portraits of Peace. And unless you've been living under a rock for the past few days, you already know that multiple attacks with multiple casualties uh, were carried out by Buddhist monks. Uh, or was it Hindu, shaman, or perhaps Mormon missionaries, perhaps Baptist church ladies? Who carried out these attacks? That's right, two brothers, uh, both followers of Islam, uh, plus another who decided, um, well, it was a good day to die and take as many as they could with them. So it wasn't the Buddhists and it wasn't the Hindus. There is only one religion on the whole of this earth that is actively attempting to murder every single other person that does not believe as they believe. Just keep that in mind. The next time somebody tries to, you know, uh, draw a moral equivalency. So what I want to focus on, because you already know about these attacks, is, is two aspects of this that sort of made my blood boil just a smidge. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, our, our dear leader uh, came out on the heels of this attack and insisted that radical Islam is not an existential threat. So he attempted to reassure the populace that radical Islam is not an existential threat. Well, uh, sir, Mr. President, I beg to differ. Uh, it surely was an existential threat for the 31 people who lost their lives, wasn't it? Uh, these were people with families and friends and plans. 
These were people who were just trying to get from point A to point D. Uh, they, they were minding their own business when all of a sudden, shortly before their demise, they hear the siren song of Allahu Akbar, and then nothing. So yes, it is an existential threat. The definition of existential, in case Columbia School of Law didn't get around to telling you, Mr. President, is something concerned with existence, or especially human existence. 31 people stopped existing, sir. 31, blink of an eye, and that's the shot across the bow, the precursor of a far more bloodshed and far more death. Now, granted, it may not be an existential threat for you with the bodyguards and the private planes and the -the round-the-clock protection. But for us average Joes, you know, the minions who finance the lavish vacations and the fancy dinner and the baseball games with communist dictators and whatnot, for us common folk, it is an existential threat. Every time we leave our house to go to the mall or get on a plane or get on a train, it becomes an existential threat when men desire nothing less than to end our lives. So no matter how you slice it, no matter how you try to spin it, Islam is more of an existential threat to human existence than this nonsensical global warming, global cooling, climate change, polar bear extinction nonsense. Another thing that I wanted to point out about this is that in recent interviews with certain imams, whenever they were asked to condemn the bloodshed and the travesty being wrought upon the unsuspecting, they simply shrug their shoulders and, and, and say it's halal. Now, if you don't know what that is, I understand. But I will clue you in because I don't speak of things that I don't study and know myself. I do not speak on a topic or a subject without having studied it. I don't want to just say things that come out of the air because, hey, they invented Google. And so if I say something stupid or foolish, like so many people are doing nowadays, somebody can just check and go, hey, he's a fool. He was lying. So yes, I've studied Islam. I've read Quranic verse. I know what it's about. I don't say these things on a whim. Islam is basically divided into five different elements of what is lawful, encouraged, and accepted, and what is discouraged and forbidden. You have the things that are fard, which are the compulsory works of a Muslim, like prayer every day. You have the things which are mustahab, which are the recommended things, things that Islam recommends that you do. Now, you have the things which are halal, which are the things that are permitted. You have the things which are makru, which are things that are disliked or disapproved of, And you have the things which are haram, which are things that are forbidden. So the killing of innocent people, according to certain imams, doesn't even fall into the makhru category. It doesn't fall into disliked or disapproved category, nor does it fall under the category of haram, which is forbidden. It is halal. It is permitted. So the slaughter of innocent men, women, and children is halal in the religion of peace. And for those of you still going on about needing to understand them better, you should just staple your coexist sticker to your eyeball. Seriously. Let's be done with the foolishness and open our eyes to what's happening in this world. Look. And I know this is an interesting segue, but I'm going to make it anyway. Sin and Islam have two things in common. Both want to destroy you, and neither of them want to coexist with you. In order to coexist with someone, you must have more than one willing participant. All the flowers and poems and peace vigils and all this other Joel Osteen-esque 
do something just to feel good but not really cause any change sort of hashtag meme foolishness is just a waste of time. It's idiocy on its face. And no, I haven't even gotten to the thing that made me angry. I'm just warming up. So anyway, to recap, 31 people dead, over 100 wounded, all in the name of the religion of peace. And with that, this has been our Portraits of Peace segment. So now on to the thing that made me angry. Huh. It was a question that was sent into the radio program by Andrea, who, uh, in a show of supreme Christian love and kindness, was blocked from a Christian Facebook group because she dared to ask about repentance. I'm going to say that again because it's so funny that it's sad. You're going to get past the acceptance. You're going to get past the shock of it all and and get right to anger. She was blocked from a Christian Facebook group because she asked about repentance. So I'm just going to read her email because it's worth reading. Then we'll get into it. Because honestly, this, this email kept me up half the night last night, and I woke up gritting my teeth. So here it is. Dear Brother Michael, I recently was blocked by fellowship, uh, I guess she means from fellowship, over my view on repentance on Facebook. There is a belief that repentance is only a change of mind, nothing more, And to say it is more is work salvation. And here's that term again. Work salvation is basically in the same grouping of words uh, as, as legalism, bigot, and homophobe now. So they also said it had nothing to do with sinning because, and they quote, God repented in the Old Testament. Isn't that grand? Now, please explain the meaning of repentance for me, and I'm sure others need to hear it. I believe it is a turning away from sin, not wanting to repeat that sin. I could be wrong, parentheses, no you're not, but since other believers are getting not taking it seriously, I am wondering if this is another deception in the church. Thank you, and God bless, Andrea. Now, the only thing that I personally despise more than intellectual dishonesty are spiritual sewer rats. These are the spiritual sewer rats that insist on living like the world yet claiming to belong to God. John called them a brood of vipers. I call them sewer rats because they're slimy and whenever you try to drag them into the light of day, they get even deeper into the darkness. Now, from what I've read, it sounds to me like you happened upon a group of hyper-Calvinists. Now, if you are a Calvinist and listening to this, you may either want to take your heart medication or turn it off uh, if you're unwilling to hear the truth. But the truth must be spoken. Now, for anyone, and I mean anyone, willing to utilize rational thought to think that the people of God got it wrong for 1,500 years and change until Calvin came along to illuminate us all is a fallacy and an idiocy and an absolute insult to reason and logic. For anyone to think that repentance only means to have a change of mind, but not a change of behavior, not a change of ideology, passions, aspirations, and the such, is likewise an insult to reason and logic. I'm sorry we're Christians, not politicians. I'm not about to have a protracted conversation about what the definition of is is. However you define is, Bill is still a scumbag. Depending upon the context, yes, repentance can mean a change of mind. And even if we left it at that, 
once you have a change of mind, isn't the rest of you supposed to follow suit? How intellectually dishonest and in love with your sin do you have to be in order to have a change of mind yet not cease the practices that bring shame to the household of faith that separate you from God and that make you a mirror image of the world? I will say it again for the upteenth time. We do not do works in order to be saved. We do works because we are saved. In everything we do, in our conduct, in our speech, in our interaction with others, our primary objective is to not bring shame to the name of Jesus and to be true and noble ambassadors of the kingdom of God. Look, I realize this is heresy to some people's ears, but there is nothing wrong with works. The Bible tells us that faith without works is dead. But apparently they haven't gotten to those verses because Calvin didn't include them in his treatise. Sorry, kids, the tulip is rotten. And if you bear no good fruit... If your entire life is a pit of sin and hedonism, yet you still think that you're saved because you waved a hand, the words depart from me will echo in your mind throughout eternity. God does not play games, and you won't be able to blame Calvin for your absence of repentance. So let's get into repentance just a little bit. And if we have time today, which I highly doubt, As I said, we'll even delve into the tail end of the doctrine of baptisms. But I've got a lot of ground to cover here, and and, and I'm I'm, I'm a little on fire. I'm not going to apologize because there's no need to apologize. If you don't like what you're hearing, you can just tune out. You know, I'm tired tired of making apologies for the truth, to be honest with you. We live in this this hypersensitive, safe space idiocy reign that we actually have to apologize for the truth that if anybody raises their voice just a smidge, it's a microaggression. If anybody hits too close to home or condemns sin in our life, well, that, that's just unloving and not Jesus-like. Excuse me? If you don't think telling you to repent is Jesus-like, then you don't know Jesus. I'm I'm tired. I am so tired. I'm so tired of this this <coughs> lazy do nothing because Jesus did everything. I'm just going to sit here in my filth and degradation because I raised a hand at a crusade mentality. If you have not known repentance, if you have not known a turning away from your sin if you have not broken ties with the world, if you have not been renewed in mind and heart, you are not saved. You are going to hell. And it's time you got your life right with God. So what is repentance? Well, in its most basic definition, repentance is turning away from a previous practice never again to return to it. Contrary to popular belief, repentance is not a feeling of remorse. It is not a feeling of regret for the sins you've committed, but an actual turning away from said sin and never revisiting it again. I meet many people who tell me that they've repented of a sin only to fall back into the self Again, well, then, my friend, it wasn't true repentance. It was perhaps a feeling of shame, of regret, of remorse. But if it had been true repentance, you would have never gone back to that sin or that practice again. Now, the second question that we must ask, especially within the context of this spiritually deluded generation is why should we preach and teach repentance? 
The simple answer is because Jesus taught and preached repentance, as did John the Baptist, as did Paul. Yes, Calvinists, Paul preached repentance, as did every disciple of Christ that is included in the Bible. Even before the act of Christ, the heart was for his people to repent and to turn back to him, that he might bless them rather than judge them, that he might comfort them rather than punish them. Repentance is the first step in our spiritual journey, a journey which lasts our entire lives here on earth. And throughout this journey, we are taken from grace to grace, from strength to strength. It's a process. One cannot achieve maturity in Christ, possess spiritual gifts, or know the fullness of the joy and peace God brings unless they have first and foremost gone through the process of repentance. Repentance is interwoven and is, in fact, a prerequisite of God throughout Scripture. There's this verse that I hear quoted very often in many churches. Uh, But it's also a verse that seems to be most misunderstood in the church as well. In fact, this, this one verse lays out what repentance truly is and the steps one must follow in order to achieve repentance. Second Chronicles, yes, we're going Old Testament. Second Chronicles 7.14, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. The shorthand version of this verse could readily be, if my people who are called by my name repent, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. Within this one word, repentance, we see a handful of actions that must take place. First, in order to experience true repentance, one must humble themselves. Second, they must pray and seek God's face. And third, they must turn from their wicked ways. Saying sorry is not enough. And no, saying sorry is not the hardest thing on the list. See, what we have to realize is this. Remorse is easy when one sees their entire life come crumbling to the ground around them. It was easy for Jimmy Swagger to feel remorseful after he got caught and he went on national television weeping weeping like a little girl. That was remorse. I believe it was authentic remorse. And it came easy because you got caught. Now, when the consequences of men's sins catch up to them, and what once seemed sweet to the taste becomes bitter, what once seemed pleasing to the eye is now grotesque and off-putting, remorse comes naturally. There are two things on this list that people seem to have trouble doing. And so many people have trouble doing this that they've erected entire doctrines to keep from doing it. The first is truly humbling themselves. And the second is turning from their wicked ways. We live in a day and age wherein Humility and humbling oneself are viewed as a weakness rather than a strength. We are taught, even within our own churches, to be self-assured and self-empowered, to view ourselves in a positive light, to see ourselves not as we truly are, but as something bigger and better and stronger than ourselves. You see, humility in its purest definition is to abase the pride and arrogance of self and to make oneself meek and submissive. Humility is acknowledging our shortcomings and failures as well as acknowledging our need for a Savior. 
we like to think that we are strong. We like to think that we can do it on our own. But it is this mindset that keeps many slaves to sin and to vice because they never cry out. They never humble themselves. They never seek the face of God. They never ask for his help or his guidance. Why would they when they're taught that they don't need to? Because repentance isn't turning away from sin. Said who? Look, repentance requires a turning from our wicked ways. The fact that we visit our sin less frequently than before is not good enough. Neither is the fact that we might not find as much pleasure in sin as we once did. Repentance is a turning away, a separation from, a renunciation of our wicked ways. Repentance is stopping in your tracks, making a 180 degree turn, and heading in the opposite direction. Now, in order to understand why such drastic measures are necessary when it comes to sin, we must first understand the destructive power of sin. Sin separates man from God. I will say it again. It is a biblical truth. Calvin can't change the biblical truth because the biblical truth is written in the Bible. It's not a treatise written in 1545. Sin separates man from God. It separates man from the grace of God. It separates man from the peace of God. And it separates man from the will of God. One cannot have sin of which they have not repented in their heart and yet presume to walk in the will of God. It is an impossibility for one to be in God's will without first having humbled themselves, sought his face, prayed, and turned from their wicked ways. You may have missed that, so I will say it again. It is an impossibility for someone to be in God's will without first having humbled themselves, sought the face of God, prayed, and turned from their wicked ways. Anyone who tells you different, don't care who they are, is a liar. They are speaking things antithetical to the word of God. They are speaking things antithetical to the truth of Scripture. Now, when this occurs in the life of an individual, when true repentance takes hold, their life is utterly transformed. Repentance is the genesis of a new life in God. We are given a new heart. We are given a new mind, new desires, a new focus. We are no longer what we once were. We no longer desire what we once desired, but are made new creatures in him. Now, in the 12th chapter of Hebrews, beginning with the 16th verse, Paul the Apostle highlights the danger of not turning from our wicked ways, but continuing to right for a mor- morsel of food. Then pen something truly remarkable, something we all need to understand deep down in our hearts. Hebrews twelve seventeen says this, And if you have your Bibles and don't believe me, crack them open. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he, meaning Esau, was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. 
when taking into account that Esau forfeited his entire future and all that the inheritance of the blessing would have meant for him for a bowl of lentil stew, it's no wonder that he sought repentance both diligently and with tears, but repentance could not be found. See, a missed opportunity, a lost opportunity, oftentimes is lost forever. One never relives the exact same moment in their existence, and one cannot go back and remedy the wrong and foolish choices that they've made. Do you realize that a man can paint, I don't know, a million blades of grass, but he can't make one of those blades of grass real? Now, you may be wondering to yourself, what does this have to do with repentance? Well, a man can let many opportunities for repentance pass him by. A man can ignore many opportunities to repent. But he can never create an opportunity for repentance on his own. What does that mean? Well, it's God working through the Holy Spirit that creates the opportunity and environment for our moment of repentance, our moment of being transformed. And it is that moment that man must choose. And yes, women must choose. Everyone must choose. themselves And receive the gift of grace from the hand of God. You see, we do not repent when we think it's an opportune moment or when we consider that it's a good season in our lives. But when God calls us to repentance, when the opportunity is presented to us, repentance in the heart of man is the work of God. Of this there can be no doubt. There is one thing that God requires of man, one thing that man must do, and that is to submit and to surrender to the truth. When we persist in our disobedience, when we dismiss opportunity after opportunity to repent and turn to God, there may come that frightful day when we as Esau will seek to find repentance with diligence and tears. But for us, it will be too late. You see, one of the enemy's greatest ploys is to convince men to forfeit their future for a moment in the present. It is exactly what happened to Esau. And herein lies the the beauty of faith. Because faith is that mystery that plucks you from the arms of the present, a present wrought with sin and despair, and translates you into the future that as yet you cannot see. No one can bypass repentance. I cannot put it any plainer than that. No one can bypass repentance and still claim to have a relationship with God. Repentance is such an important element in our spiritual growth that Christ, John the Baptist, Peter, Paul, all of them called men to repentance first and foremost. In the Gospel according to Matthew, we see John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, as many of the Pharisees and Sadducees came to his baptism, John the Baptist addressed them, not in a soothing, loving fashion, not with a church organ playing in the background, just as I am, but rather with a harsh rebuke. Matthew 3, 7 and 8 says it this way, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? 
Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Well, that, that can't be. John the Baptist was preaching work salvation. What do you mean bear fruits? We're not supposed to do anything. It's just grace. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I can do whatever I want. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. I'm not going to have this argument with you. It's in the book. The Pharisees and Sadducees wanted the baptism of John absent the requisite repentance. And his question to them was, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He then goes on to open their eyes to the reality that absent repentance, baptism is just taking a bath with your clothes on and nothing more. He admonishes them to bear fruits worthy of repentance first and then come for baptism. Now, in the next chapter of Matthew, Jesus begins his preaching ministry by echoing the selfsame words that John the Baptist spoke in the previous chapter. Matthew 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, Seeing as all the pillars of the faith, including Jesus himself, preached repentance, the next logical question that we must ask is why? Why is repentance such an important aspect of our Christian walk? There is no better answer to this question than the one that Paul gives to the learned men and philosophers of Athens as he delivers his sermon on Mars Hill, confounding the wisest men of that time. In Acts 17, 30 and 31, Paul writes this, Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness not according to Calvin not according to Luther not according to Boldia or Olstein Lord forbid not according to Benny Hinn he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. Who is that man? That man is Jesus. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So why repent? Because God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. This man is none other than Christ. In absent repentance, the righteousness of God will constrain him to judge us together with the world. There is another aspect of this passage that is worth delving into, and that is the fact that God commands all men everywhere. And we just plucked another petal from the tulip. All men everywhere. Not just some men, not just some men from a certain bloodline or nation or denomination, all men everywhere, young or old, rich or poor, wise man or fool, all men everywhere are commanded to repent. Now, whether we submit, whether we humble ourselves and obey God's command, well, that's entirely on our shoulders. You see, the message has not changed over the centuries. The message has remained the same. It has withstood the test of time. Repent, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. 
men have attempted to sugarcoat it in order to make it more palatable. Some have even attempted to remove it from among the necessary aspects of salvation because it requires change on our part. And that's not very popular nowadays. You see, this is the ugly truth. Too many people want to remain in their sin, tethered to their vices, and still enjoy all the benefits of sonship. Too many, far too many today, want to have one foot in the world and another in the church, not because they desire a true and lasting relationship with Christ, but simply to have something akin to preemptive fire insurance. Attending a church service, even becoming a member of a given denomination without true repentance will do absolutely nothing to bring you into a right standing with God. Now, I realize that self-deception is a powerful tool, and many people today employ it liberally. But the truth is self-sustaining, and it will not conform itself to the times to the culture, or to men's whims. Romans 12, 2 says it this way, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This was Paul's admonition to the Romans, and it remains his admonition to us all. Just because a certain viewpoint is widely accepted by the world, it does not make it right or true. Look, you've got an entire generation believing that climate change is going to be the end of us. Seriously? Now, I know it's off on a tangent, but it's just ridiculous. The only way to obtain forgiveness The only way to obtain salvation is by way of repentance. If I came to you today and said, as many say, believe only, that I would be doing you the greatest disservice. One cannot possess faith, nor can one have faith in Christ, if they have not first experienced true repentance. See, we have this tendency to put the cart before the horse, as it were. And rather than preach repentance, again, the self-same repentance that was preached by Christ and echoed by all of his apostles, we tell people to believe only and everything will be well and good. Repentance first. Repentance First, because repentance produces in us a transformed mind, a transformed heart, a transformed will, and transformed desires. In essence, when a soul repents, it turns away from sin and towards God. As Paul was bidding farewell to the Ephesian elders in the book of Acts, in, in, in the 28th chapter, He encourages his fellow brothers in Christ by telling them that he had kept nothing back from them that was helpful, but proclaimed repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ to them. We repent away from sin, but towards God. As I heard it said once, true repentance is the unyielding desire not to break God's heart. I thought that was so very well put. True repentance is the unyielding desire not to break God's heart. It's not feeling remorse because you got caught doing something you were not supposed to in the first place. 
It's turning away from sin. It's turning away from the world. It's not doing those things that we know God is displeased with so that we would not break his heart anymore. Yes, repentance is a turning. It is a transformation, a change that is vital and that is crucial and that is necessary for everyone who desires to walk according to the will of God. Everyone needs repentance. There are no exemptions. There are no special passes. There are no exclusions. There is pervasive mentality among some believers that says one need only repent if they were truly wicked before coming to Christ. As such, there are some who feel they have no need of repentance because they didn't steal and they didn't murder and they didn't commit any really bad sins, as the saying goes. Look, we don't just repent from sin. We also repent from dead works. If the wellspring of our effort and our works and our deeds and our actions is not Christ Jesus, then even the most giving, charitable, and generous works that we can perform are dead and have no value in and of themselves. Works, no, will not get us into heaven. Grace and Christ will. So are you saying we shouldn't be generous and benevolent? Are are you saying we shouldn't give? No, that's not what I'm saying, and you know that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that we do not do works in order to be saved, as I said at the beginning of the program. We do works because we are saved. We do not do works in order to be saved, as though by our works we might obtain salvation, but rather... Because we are saved, we are compelled by the nature of Christ in us to works of righteousness. Being saved is having the heart of Christ. And having the heart of Christ compels us to reach out to the hurting, to the hungry, to the forsaken, and to the forgotten. The program can be entertaining, the pastor can be eloquent, the sermon engaging and humorous. But if repentance is not the same, if remission of sins in his name is not preached, if Christ is not preeminent and glorified, then all it was was wasted time. Yes, it might make the flesh feel a little better, especially if it's a message about being positive or having good self-esteem. But in the end, when all is said and done, the hollowness still remains because the essence of the message was something other than Christ. Now, I realize one thing. Repentance will never be popular. Repentance will never draw the big crowds. It will never be what the majority want to hear. But it is what they need to hear. Absent falling on our face at the foot of the cross, absent true repentance, the repentance that transforms a man from the inside out, we will never know the fullness of God nor the fullness of his power. Look, when I first started out in ministry, I made a vow to God. And that vow was that I would preach the gospel of Christ in its entirety. And that I would focus on the essential doctrines that are largely being ignored in the contemporary church. I also vowed that I would not sugarcoat harsh truths just to spare feelings. So here is a harsh but necessary truth. Religiosity will not save your soul. Your denomination will not save your soul. Great entertainment 
will not save your soul. Calvin will not save your soul. Throwing a hand up in the air at a crusade but never really being transformed, never really experiencing repentance will not save your soul. Only humbling yourself, falling at the foot of the cross, repenting, turning away from your old life and turning towards God will save your soul. Unpopular stand? Unequivocally, yes. But biblically sound? Unequivocally, yes. All I can do is share the truth with you. Whether you receive it or reject it, entirely up to you. So, Andrea or Andrea, I hope I've answered your question. Uh, You were not wrong in your assessment. Unfortunately, this is modern-day Christianity. There are fools blowing themselves up for a lie and, and taking innocent people with them. And we who claim to know the truth will not even live for Jesus with all our hearts. We don't want to exert ourselves. We don't want to do anything. We want to have the best of both worlds, and God help you if you say otherwise. Look, the truth is as sad as it is simple. Men love their sin. Men love their sin more than they love God, and anyone who will tell them that they can hold on to their sin, that they can hold on to their depravity, that they can hold on to their perversions and lust and still have God's favor, will be exalted, elevated, supported, and and be anointed the next mouthpiece of God. How dare we turn grace into licentiousness? How dare we trample upon the blood of Christ by continuing in the same sin that his shed blood ought to have freed us from? How dare we abuse the goodness of God, and twist the gospel to fit our own indulgences. Since we have a couple minutes, I want to read a few scriptures. And, and these are a few things that Paul wrote. Yes, Paul, the self-same Paul that Calvinists revert to every time anyone brings up righteousness or holiness. And these passages will shed some light on the reality of the man's true nature. And it doesn't make the argument so one-sided as is presented by the spiritual sewer rats. Romans 6, 1 through 4. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, We were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Now, when Paul wrote about grace, he wasn't looking for an excuse or a loophole to keep sinning, like so many people are doing today. He was in awe of grace. He was in awe of its power to restore and to reconcile man unto God, as we all should be. But he realized that once we were baptized into Christ's death, we would walk in newness of life. Hebrews 10, 26 through 31 says it this way, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation in which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? 
For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So how exactly do these scripture passages add up with the claims by some preachers that they can even take the mark of the beast or be caught committing adultery when Jesus returns and still make it into heaven? The whole notion that the blood of Jesus washes your future sins as well as your past sins is a modern-day invention. Jesus said, go and sin no more. Your past is forgiven you, but your future must belong to Christ. And that was my message for tonight. Gino, if you're there, I'm done. Amen, brother. God help our country. Because that's not preached, that's not taught the way it should be. And folks, I think we will probably enter into part two of this next week. I'm, I'm thinking that Mike will continue fundamental teachings, and this is a biggie. God bless you all. Thank you for listening. The show will be up on YouTube uh, by Monday. And uh, tune in and invite friends to next week's broadcast. God bless. <laughs>